It's now time to look at the remaining unknown function in the spherical harmonics, the associated Legendre functions. This is part of our attempt to understand the eigenfunctions of angular momentum, which are relevant to quantum systems with spherical symmetry. If you are just joining us, consider watching lecture 11 first to better follow this lecture. The link is in the description. If not, let's continue. We could generate the differential equation for these functions using the eigenfunction equation and the spherical coordinate representation of L square. Let's apply this operator to YLM. The second derivative with respect to the angle phi acts on the L3 eigenfunction to give minus m square. After this step, the L3 eigenfunction can be factored out since there's no longer any term dependent on phi within the curly braces. Thus we are left with the differential equation for the function p. Now we can see that this function is only dependent on m through its magnitude because only m squared appears in this equation. This equation is known as the general Legendre equation and defines the associated Legendre functions. We can put this in a different form by noticing this identity, which is just an application of the chain rule of derivatives. Applying this to the first differential operator on the left hand side, we have Sine square can be written as 1 minus cosine square. Here we make a change of coordinates to x defined by cosine theta. For the second term, we can write sine square by 1 minus x square. And we have reached an alternate form for the Legendre equation. We could solve this equation directly to obtain p and use it to get the spherical harmonics YLM. These results are readily available in most mathematical handbooks. We shall not discuss them here. The earlier algorithm we have introduced involving the Laplace equation seems much simpler and intuitive. In fact, when we get to chapter 4, where angular momentum is discussed more completely, we will find an algebraic relation that will allow us to obtain the entire multiplet of solutions for a given L, all from a single solution. For now, let's just use this equation to evaluate the normalization of the spherical harmonics. A suitable normalization condition would be requiring that the integral of the absolute square of y over the entire solid angle to be equal to 1. This condition can always be satisfied by an appropriate choice of the overall constant of y, which is not fixed by the Laplace equation. A more general quantity would be the inner product of two arbitrary spherical harmonics. The integral over the angle phi is given by the following, with the integrand as the product of two eigenfunctions of L3. Since the difference between m and m prime must be an integer, the result should be proportional to this Kronecker's delta. Because when m is not equal to m prime, the integrand is a harmonic function with period 2 pi. Integrating any such function over its period must necessarily give zero. Whereas if m equals m prime, then the integrand is just 1 and the integral is non-zero. 
The constant of proportionality in this inner product is fixed by the normalization condition above. Since if the two spherical harmonics are equal, then the right hand side must be equal to 1. We will now show that the right hand side is in fact also equal to another Kronecker's delta. Delta L, L prime. Together, these two deltas establish the auto normality conditions for spherical harmonics. Since we have just shown that the integral over phi gives the delta for m's, we must now show that the remaining theta integral results in the delta for l's. Note that we can set both m's in the functions p to be equal since this integral is multiplied by the delta of m's. To answer this question, we can use the general Lejeune equation satisfied by p, and to save some space, we shall hide the theta dependence of p. We want to try and calculate the integral in the green box with this equation. As a start, multiply both sides of this equation by sine theta times p l prime. There's a bunch of cancellations of sine on the left hand side while the right-hand side gain a factor of sine. We can generate another equation by simply switching L and L prime. Then subtract the second equation from the first. The terms symmetric in L and L prime cancels away. Let's simplify the left hand side further. This term can be written as a total derivative with a correction. This is to cancel the additional derivative of P L prime, which is not actually present. Similarly, for the second term, Notice that the corrections of the two terms actually cancels. Now we are ready to evaluate the integral in the green box. The integral on the left hand side is just what we are after. Notice that on the right hand side, we have an integral of a total derivative. The sine theta vanishes at both endpoints. So the right hand side of this equation is zero. If the prefactor on the left hand side is not zero, that is, when L is not equal to L prime, then we can conclude that this integral is zero. If we include the case for L equals L prime, then the left hand side can be replaced by a delta. This is so because when L equals L prime, this is an integral over the square of a function, which is always equal to a positive number, if the function is not simply zero everywhere. Thus we have verified the identity we set out to prove. Let's demonstrate the auto-normality of the spherical harmonics, including the earlier integral over phi, which is proportional to the delta of m m prime. This delta will allow us to write m prime for the second function. We can then write the integrand as a product of spherical harmonics. By choosing the appropriate normalization constant, we are led to the auto-normality of the spherical harmonics. The last property of the spherical harmonics which we will derive 
is its behavior under parity transformation. This is defined by the inversion of the position vector. Let's recall that y is a homogeneous polynomial consisting of terms like this with powers of L. Under the parity transformation in the green box, y transforms into. Let's see how the angular coordinates are transformed by parity. The blue arrow is the original position vector. Under parity, it transforms into the red arrow. The transform theta is just pi minus the original value. Projecting this into the xy plane. We could see that phi prime is just phi plus pi. The yellow and blue boxes are the rules for parity transformation of the angular coordinates. Therefore, the transform function y can be written as This is how YLM transforms under parity. And this is all we have to say about spherical harmonics. Here's a quick summary of what we have learned. Thus we have solved the angular momentum part of the eigenfunction problems. These constitute the angular dependence of the wave function. The radial part is still unconstrained by these equations. This is to be fixed by the energy eigenfunction equation. We will solve this in the next lecture when we introduce specific examples of a particle moving in central potentials.